I wanted to start off with maybe if you could give us an update on the current number of cases of COVID in Dufferin, Wellington, Guelph. Well, the, the numbers continue to rise, albeit quite slowly. So it appears that we've had a somewhat of a flattening of our curve. We are finding new cases each a day. We still have, uh, every day we have to, cases that come reported in. And currently we're over 150 cases in the area, of which interestingly enough, uh, Dufferin does disproportionately based on his population have more cases than uh, Wellington or Guelph uh, on a population basis. Um, are these numbers a lot higher? Or are they potentially a lot higher um, due to the fact that a lot of people, I guess, are being told to stay home and monitor their symptoms um, before coming out to one of the treatment centers? Is it, is it potential that it's a lot higher than what it is showing right now? Well, anytime we monitor for diseases, we always know that the people who get tested are only just a small portion of the people with disease. What I can say, though, is that when people are isolating at home, is that people in general are actually a bit healthier right now. We've seen our influenza rates uh, plummet, uh, calls to physicians' offices for coughs and colds also seem to have declined. So by people self-isolating, not only are they protecting themselves from COVID-19, they're also not getting sick from a number of other viruses as well. And let's talk about that. The people that are actually experiencing symptoms or health issues that are not related to COVID-19, um, what should they do? People who maybe um, have an ailment or have hurt themselves, um, what's the best way for them to get treatment? right now? That's, that's a really a great question, actually, because our family physicians and our nurse practitioners, they're actually working. So you can actually access your own primary care provider right now on the phone. And sometimes you'll actually be asked to come into the office, depending on what it is. If you have a child that needs immunizations, for example, um, you can probably access that in a safe manner in the physician's office. And there are some things that you just can't do over the phone. So for people who have health conditions um, and you're wondering if you can get help, you absolutely can. Call your family doctor and they will look after you. Wonderful. And obviously, in case of an emergency, that's when they call 911. We want to make sure that oh, yeah. people are taken. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So with the projected numbers, um, I guess, that the, the government's been giving us, the province, um, do you feel, this is kind of a related, it's very fluid situation, but um, do we feel that we've, we're, ugh, we've reached the peak of our of COVID-19? Well, usually when we, we say we've reached the peak, we always do that looking backwards. And then that's when we know we have uh, reached the peak and have, have gone past it. So it's a little bit of a retrospective look. Uh, Teresa Tam, the Chief Medical Officer of Health for the, uh, the country of Canada, did seem to indicate that there's been a definite flattening of the curve. And I, I strongly want to congratulate people for social distancing. It's actually made a real difference. Uh, we are not in Italy. Uh, we are doing uh, quite well. Please keep up the good work because it looks like our numbers are starting to stabilize. And I think it's really important too that we point out this doesn't mean there's a lapse in the, the physical distancing. This doesn't mean that we should stop doing what we're doing. We don't want to go out there and cause another spike right now. Oh, absolutely. So and yeah, absolutely. Like it is working, the, all the measures that we are are doing are working. It does take a little while for people to incubate. So anything that people may have caught takes uh, on average about five days, sometimes a bit longer, sometimes a bit less. So we're always doing a little bit of catch up when it comes to disease uh, finding uh, because of that. And where is the best place for people to gather information? We are being overwhelmed in social media, on the news and the radio with a lot of information, some of it being very accurate, um, some of it um, questionable. Uh, so where's the best place for people, the residents of Dufferin County, Wellington and Guelph to get the best information on them or the most up-to-date current information? Yeah, well, I'm going to suggest uh, two, two websites that are really good, but the first is ours, Wellington Dufferin Guelph, publichealth.ca, WDG publichealth.ca. And if you Google Dufferin Public Health, uh, you'll get to our website. Well, as soon as you get to our website on the opening page, there's two buttons if you're a healthcare provider or if you're a regular 
uh, citizen, uh, just ch choose a button that applies to you. And on our site, we carried links to every website, every document. It's a good place to start and it should give you all the credible information you need. Second place, if you want to go and look for and read more scientific documents is Public Health Ontario. And Public Health Ontario um, has many documents there and, and many reviews on best practices for you to read. So there's been some conflicting stories online and in the news with regards to the use of masks or non-medical masks. Um, is this something that we should all now be wearing as a non-medical mask when we're going in? Yeah, you're right. And we certainly have seen and, and read all kinds of uh, conflicting stories on that. And it's often appeared that, that the message has changed slightly over the last few weeks, which does make it confusing. I think the important thing here is there's two points I want to make is, first of all, for people who are non-medical people, we're really talking about cloth masks. We're not talking about surgical masks. I really want to encourage our listeners to leave the medical grade surgical masks to the healthcare providers because we don't have enough. And so if you're using their supply, then they may run out. So let's we're so we're not talking about that. We're talking about cloth masks, homemade masks. And there is evidence that they do work, but they don't work necessarily in the way people think that they work. People wear them thinking that they're being protected. And actually, they may be protecting others from them. So if people have symptoms or are in an early, um, what we call a pre-symptomatic phase where they may be shedding, wearing a cloth face mask may decrease their shedding into the environment. It is important to recognize, though, that um, social distancing or physical distancing is very important as well. A mask doesn't protect you. And some people get this false sense of, security i'm wearing a mask i can get close to people no we really want to encourage people to continue to have physical distancing it is probably helpful though if you can't avoid physical distancing and sometimes you're getting on an elevator or you're getting into a streetcar or bus uh, perhaps those are better environments but above all it is meant to protect uh it's meant to protect others from you you protect yourself by staying home and if you do have to go out, uh, physical distancing. Absolutely. So for those people that are wearing the non-medical masks, um, maybe you could give us some pointers or some tips on the proper way to do so um, and the proper care, because once you've worn it, it, it technically, I guess, becomes contaminated. Is that correct? I think it depends on uh, how long you've had it on for and in what environment that you're wearing them. So the typical person might put it on to run into a grocery store or pharmacy and so for a short period of time. We absolutely recommend that the masks are washed frequently um, and it depends on how much you, you're wearing it though and how often that is. But yes, please wash them frequently. How should they fit? Well, it is important that they fit around the face as best as you can. There's different actual patterns out there um, on the internet so some faces might uh, need one pattern and some faces might need another so find the one that works for you that's comfortable and that provides a reasonable fit around your face be really careful when you're wearing one to not adjust it anytime you reach up your hands and adjust your mask or move it you're, you run the risk of taking your hands which may have COVID-19 on them and contaminating your face and we know that's a really important thing is to not do that if you want to take it off after you've worn it, the most important thing is to remember is to not contaminate your face as you're doing so. So I usually recommend if people have an opportunity to either use hand sanitizer or wash their hands, reach behind and touch the pieces that go around behind the ears. So you're actually removing the mask from your ears, knowing that the front part of the mask may actually be contaminated. So try not to touch that, take it off from your ears and take it down this way. And then always wash your hands after you've taken it off. Absolutely. Washing your hands is critically important throughout this entire process as everybody has been stressing and we've all seen. Yeah. Um, if somebody actually starts to feel um, some of the symptoms that are related to COVID-19, um, where can they find the self-assessment tool or what, what should they do? Yeah, well, you can find it on our website. We have a link to that. So if you manage to get to wdgpublichealth.ca's website, that will take you to the link. The Ministry of Health also has, if you just Google assessment tool, COVID assessment tool, any of those will come up and uh, that will help provide that answer for you. If you have symptoms, mild symptoms, you could also call your family doctor and they will do uh, a telephone assessment with you and they may actually send you to the assessment center for a swap. 
Wonderful. So let's talk about, um, we're all trying to limit the, the amount of times we're going out um, to once a week to get the groceries or pertinent things that we do need, medication, that sort of thing. Let's talk about the food products. Should we be wiping down and disinfecting all of the boxes and cans and everything that we're picking up from the stores when we get home from doing the groceries? That's um, a good question, and I think it's also a, a fairly low-risk activity. First of all, we do know that virus can only uh, grow or stays alive on a cardboard for up to 24 hours. And the way the virus is, so, so I, I want to make sure your listeners understand that it's this virus is a piece of an organism. It's actually not a whole organism. It's not like a bacteria, which is a complete whole unit. This is a piece of RNA in this case. This piece of RNA can't grow outside of a human host. So it just sits there for a while and dies. So it's not multiplying. So if there is RNA left on a, on a surface, over time it will die just in and of itself. And we know that on cardboard it's up to 24 hours. And most, and it's not linear, it means that at the 12 hour mark, half of it's gone and half of it's still there. It doesn't work like that. The majority of the uh, the virus dies very quickly in the first part of the cycle. So all of the products that you are picking up, um, they're still very, very low risk. If you have and you're, you're concerned out of an abundance of caution, you know you could certainly leave them um, untouched for 24 hours. But really, honestly, it's a very low risk thing. And the fruits and vegetables that you are handling and bringing in, just wash them like you normally would. You don't have to use soap. In fact, sometimes soap leaves contaminants uh, and residue on uh, some surfaces. I went, you know, broccoli or lettuce. So just uh, just use water and wash them as you normally would. So I know that you're incredibly busy with everything that you're doing, um, but do you, I, I'm just, I've been asking all of uh, my guests this question. What have you been doing to kind of keep sane? Because obviously this um, COVID-19 crisis has kind of upped <laughs> the amount of time I'm sure you're spending working. Um, so what are you doing to kind of uh, keep joyful and positive and, and uh, spend some of your off time? That's a great question. I don't have quite as much off time as I used to have. So you're right, I am working a lot of hours. And uh, for me, I uh, practice uh, yoga um, and meditation. So I, I, I used, can still get uh, yoga online. And still, I still have an ability to continue to do my yoga, even if it's not in the same place or time uh, that I used to do it. So I encourage your listeners to try to find something that works for them, that, that they enjoy. So when we're talking about the people that uh, work for public health, how has it affected how you're doing your job daily? Obviously, you're, you're joining us from home today as I'm here in my home. Um, but how, what have been the challenges for you? Yeah, uh, well, certainly we have redeployed staff into jobs that they don't normally do. So uh, the willingness and the support of the public health staff has been just uh, fantastic as they've all had to learn to do something different, often in a different location. You are correct. I'm home today. I, I'm going to spend one or two days uh, a week uh, working from home. Most of my staff, um, I shouldn't say most, but quite a few of my staff are also working from home, some of them permanently, some of them intermittently. Um, and the ones that are still working working at the actual building, we've spread them out. So they're no longer in close proximity, sometimes to their colleagues and the, the people that they've worked beside for years, They've everybody's spread out. So that's a bit of a, a difference for them. And uh, certainly uh, every corner of our building now is sort of utilized for spreading people out for social distancing or physical distancing while we work. So there's been, uh, there's been some uh, positives as well too. I think that we've all learned uh, different things about ourselves as we've had to learn how to do different skills and do things that differently and uh, yeah it's um, it's an interesting time in public health this program is brought to you by ignite tv now you're in command visit rogers.com for more details Through yoga, meditation, and restorative postures, we'll understand where you're holding stress and tension and find new ways to rebalance your energy and reawaken your life purpose.
Welcome to this COVID-19 update for Rogers. My name is Tina Avery. I hope this finds you all safe and healthy. Today joining me is Heather Loney. She's a communications and community engagement officer for the Upper Grand District School Board. Uh, thank you, Heather, so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me. Well, I know that we just recently, or you just recently launched the distance learning program. Can you tell us a little bit about the process in creating the program? Sure. So. Following the announcement from the Ministry of Education that school boards would uh, not reopen following that initial closure period after March break, uh, school boards were instructed to develop their own distance learning programs for their students. So um, for several weeks, teams of board staff members, we worked around the clock to develop a program for upper grand students, um, which launched to students on April 6th. Um, so for years, the board has already had a really great um, online resources and platforms for our students to use while at home. So such as things like UG Cloud, UG To Go, those tools that we've had for the last several years. However, um, we've never before been tasked with provided distance learning for our 35,000 students across our region. And also getting our thousands of staff members up and running working remotely. Well, let's talk about that. What what did it take to get all of this up and running? Because I mean, 35,000 students, I don't know how many teachers and, and board members this involves, but that sounds like quite the undertaking. So let's it, talk it, a little bit about that. It has been quite the undertaking. It's also been pretty remarkable to see um, what has come together in, in a short period of time. So we had numerous staff teams and committees looking at all different areas. Um, that are important to making this work. So for instance, our access to technology committee, equity of access, we had diff distance learning co um, committees for our younger students, our intermediate students and our high school students, um, making sure that our high school courses are transferred over to a distance model so that students can continue to get their credits and graduate. Uh, we also had a work from home committee to support our staff and our operations department has been really hard at work um, ensuring that our buildings and our schools are secure and safe um, and that we're adhering to the public health protocols around physical distancing and gathering. So let's talk about some of the challenges that it took to for so many schools and students um, to work remotely. Sure. So um, access to technology is definitely one thing that's been a challenge, um, but staff have worked really hard to address that. Um, so in many cases, Students might not have access to a device or a computer or a laptop at home, um, and that could be for many reasons. And right now, especially, there are a lot of parents who are working from home, and there are a lot of people who might need to use the same device in the household, so there just weren't enough computers to go around. Um, so what we did, the week prior to launching our distance learning program, teachers contacted every family in our board to check in on them, ask them about their technology needs, and other supports that they may require. Um, so from there, we developed a plan to safely go into our schools and retrieve Chromebooks and technology for students. So over the course of one week, our schools shipped out and delivered more than 3,200 Chromebooks to students in our board, uh, which was quite remarkable to see. Um, and just everybody was really, that was something that was sort of like, okay, like we can do this, you know, we got all of those devices out. Um, there are still challenges to address, but that was one thing that we were really excited about. Um, so another challenge is something um, that many boards are struggling with in the province and that's access to internet. So uh, there are still many areas of our board um, where there isn't reliable internet. Um, so right now we're working through different options about how we could address this. Um, and we've also developed a plan for getting printed materials to students who either don't have internet access or who just prefer to use printed materials and hands-on materials when they're learning. Well, that's a phenomenal amount of work. I can't even begin to, I mean, we obviously none of us were actually expecting any of this to happen. So just to have this thrown towards you, um, yeah, congratulations for getting that all pulled together. Um, and still, and I know, and I understand it's fluid and it's still changing and still, and you're still working on improvements and, and, and yeah. different ways people. Absolutely. Um, so what is it like, let's talk about the, this, the perspective from the student. What, what is it like for them? What, what is it the process that happens, um, for the students right now? Yeah, so um, as part of our board's program for distance learning, we're using different tools such as Google Classroom, uh, Google Sites, and Brightspace as our distance learning platforms. So the student experience itself, it'll vary depending on the grade and the teacher. 
teachers have flexibility in how they provide their instruction to their class. Um, but they're planning their instruction by using the overall expectations that are contained in the ministry's curriculum for each course. Um, so it is based on the curriculum. Um, and then their course content is adapted and refined for a distance learning model. So um, while it's impossible for teachers to replicate that face-to-face -face instruction, um, their focus is going to be on the key learning outcomes for each of their courses. So it could be a teacher uploading um, an assignment to their Google Classroom and then the students can go in and they can see what that assignment is, they can do their work, upload it back up. But again, teachers are using lots of different resources. So they might be recording videos of themselves and uploading that to the classroom. Um, they, it might be written assignments. It might be, um, it could take a variety of different formats. Um, and teachers are really excited to try new things and to really focus on what works for their students um, and provide that you know, differentiated instruction for each, for each student. And in our secondary student, uh, schools, the focus of student learning is really the completion of course credits and for our grade 12 students, of course, graduation. Wonderful. I mean, I, I guess it would be challenging. I'm looking at it from my son's perspective, like uh, he's in grade 10. He, um, you know, the courses he has this particular semester, you know, one of them being music, one of them being auto. And I was like, well, how are we doing that? And I mean, the teachers are doing a phenomenal job of getting information out and this process to them. And, you know, and I, I understand it, you know, like I said, things are changing, but you always think like auto, how can you do auto from home or something like that? But I mean, they're, they have these different modules. They're still working, um, which yeah. I think is absolutely great. So ha has it been working fairly well so far? Yeah, it's been really, really great to see. And just one one point to the to the auto comment that you made. Our all of the tech heads in all of our high schools, they're working together to figure out how to really bring those performance based courses. Something that you would think like, how would you possibly do that in a distance learning model? And they're making arrangements and they are developing these courses that in a distance learning model for something that would be a very much an in person performance based course. So. Um, the innovation that you can see from some of the these teachers that's really really exciting so the feedback that we've received so far has been really encouraging um, we've received a lot of feedback on things that are working well um, and also things that we need to continue to focus on um, so we when we launched the program we knew it was not going to be perfect uh, we knew that it wasn't going to be a hundred percent ready to go at launch but we did think that it was important to get it off the ground quickly so we wanted to reach as many students as possible right off the bat and then continue to evolve the program, add in new components, engage our support staff uh, who are reaching out to our students with special, special education needs, uh, unique learning needs, um, equity of access um, challenges as well. So it's been, it's been really great to see it evolve and it'll continue to evolve in stages um, as the weeks go. Well, I think one thing that I've taken out of um, what's happening so far, um, you know, I mean, there's such, there's a lot of news there that can be stressful and cause anxiety and all that sort of thing. But one thing I've taken away from it uh, personally and with people that I've spoken to and interviewed um, is that there are, you have to look at the good points of what's happening. So moving forward, um, when you have this distance learning program completely perfected and, you know, obviously there's always updates and that sort of thing, but moving forward, this provides a platform, um, let's say for a student that has to, happens to be homesick or, you know, for an extended period of time or something like that. There's always, it's kind of gives us things that might be useful in the future um, and hopefully not for such um, for dire needs that we, we have it for now. Um, right. So what about the evaluation? and um, assessment, how is, do, how is that working for the students? Right, so this is one piece that will continue to evolve and that we'll continue to share information with our families you know, as, it, as we get information from the ministry and also as, as the program develops. Um, we have been informed by the ministry that students will receive final report cards, um, but there will be more to come um, from the province and then which we will communicate out to our families regarding assessment. Uh, speaking about the province, I know that they just recently extended the amount of time or the amount of closure for the schools. Is there or have you heard anything with regards to if the students will be returning at all for, until the end of the year? Uh, so we know at this point, what we know is that the Premier has said students will not be returning to class on May 4th. Um, at this time, we're still awaiting further information from the province on the extent of the, the closure period. 
Um, but we do know that the province is taking this very seriously and they're taking their guidance from the health authorities and are making these decisions really on a community and public health basis for the safety of our communities. So once we do get a, a date from the province, we will absolutely share that out with our school communities. And I think that's vitally important that people remember that this is all for the safety of, of everyone, your families, your friends, people that you don't know, um, the community, the country in general. So it's very important that you realize that um, these dates are always changing. This information is always changing as everyone can see on the news um, what's happening. So please keep that in mind. Um, I think that um, the school board is doing a great job so far in, in trying to to keep the school year rolling and keeping everything in place. Um, and I understand that the board is doing um, some community outreach and some volunteering. Let's talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. So that's been one thing that's been absolutely um, inspiring to see, which is just how many people um, on their own time have stepped up to help in the fight against uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So for instance, um, we have a team of staff members who for the last several weeks um, have been using the board's 3D printers to produce productive, protective face shields uh, for front frontline healthcare workers. So they're up to now producing nearly 200 per day, and they'll continue to do so for as long as the need exists. It's just been incredible to see. Um, we also had our operations department. They went into uh, our different schools and our board sites, and they collected any extra gloves, masks, any PPE that we had extra supplies of, and they donated that to help with local urgent um, healthcare needs. So we ended up donating around 100,000 gloves um, to help with our, um, our, help, our, our healthcare workers in the community. Um, and we've also seen, you know, teachers have been posting videos of um, sewing face masks uh, in their spare time. Um, and you know, sharing patterns for how to sew face masks, that sort of thing. So it's just been really, really great to see that community aspect. Um, and it's something that I think that people need right now as well to, there's a lot going on. So it's, it's really great to see communities come together and you know, the school communities are, are absolutely a part of that. So I know you're incredibly busy, but let's talk about what are you doing to keep sane <laughs> in this time of isolation in our homes? Well, um, fortunately for me, I am lucky that um, I am still able to work from home full time and work, as you've just heard, has been very, very busy. So work is a good thing um, for to keep me busy. Um, you know, lots of walking up and down stairs and, and trying to remember, uh, you know, things that I've always wanted to cook and maybe I'll, I'll try that recipe and just those little sorts of things. It's been nice to have those little moments in the day. Um, you, you maybe, you know, taking a moment with a loved one and having a cup of coffee over a video, um, things that I wouldn't have slowed down and done before. So just trying to remember those, those little moments where things get a little slower and just remembering to breathe through it. We're all in this together. So that's been really helping. Heather, I want to thank you so much for joining me today. And uh, when you have updates, please let me know and we'll get you back on here. So, so let's um, but you take care and thank you. Again. Thank you so much. I'm Jennifer. And I'm Allison. We are so excited to be back for another season of The Parenting Show. Yes, and the topics for this round are things like the infiltration of tech in the family, ways for parents to prevent underage drinking, good old sibling fighting and rivalry, and how to handle those nasty power struggles in the family. And it's a great way for you to realize that you are not alone. It's all right here on Rogers TV. Dear everybody, you'll see thousands of images today. Here are three you won't see. A 
girl who uses a walker eating ice cream with her friends. A young woman with a prosthetic leg modeling the latest denim trends. A kid who uses a wheelchair busting a dance move. You're influenced by the images you see and the ones you don't. It's time to include disability in the picture. Sign Hall & Blurview's Dear Everybody Agreement and help create a world without stigma for kids and youth with disabilities. Visit DearEveryBody.ca. Um, I am excited to introduce a new guest. He's an Orangeville resident um, that's making a big difference on the fight for COVID-19, Louis Sappy. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's my pleasure, Tina. So how are you doing? Just a general question. I am, I am running a race for the last month that I didn't expect to run. Uh, it's been very, very hectic, but I tend to get off on things like that. So I'm, I'm good. As long as I get a few hours of sleep at night, I'm happy, man. <laughs> That's wonderful. So I understand that you have been working on a new ventilator over the past few years, and now all of a sudden there's a huge demand uh, for this product. Can you tell us how it all began? Absolutely. So I've always been rather philanthropic, and I also do an awful lot of guest lecturing, you know, MBA schools and, and the Rick Center, which is a government-backed uh, 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 startup assistance program, you know, research, innovation, commercialization. So I'm a mentor and a lecturer. And during one of my lectures, about three and a half years ago, a young doctor came up to me, uh, Dr. Dio, uh, and he basically told me about how he immigrated to Canada, but he always had this dream to create a, an emergency ventilator, which was an odd thing to bring up. And then he told me his story, where as an emergency doctor in Africa, he would see many, many people die needlessly from respiratory distress because it's in the developing nations, they can't afford respirators uh, ventilators, that is, which are, you know, sophisticated. You know, these ventilators can start off at 20,000 US and go up. What they were using was handheld bags that you press, compress with a mask. So you can imagine someone who is in dire need of, of aid, you need to have a separate person, 724, compressing these bags. And it just wasn't possible. So he, he almost had tears in his eyes where he's saying that these young children were dying, older people dying needlessly because there was simple solutions that they simply could not afford. So in his mind, he had developed this concept of an emergency ventilator that would be ultra compact, compact very low cost so that developing nations could afford them and something that could save lives. He, he, was, he was a humanitarian driven to save lives, not just to produce a product to make profit. So he came to me and I, I just, you know, I'm a very busy guy. I have many other philanthropic uh, programs I do and, and there's my companies and clients, but I couldn't say no to this gentleman. I just fell in love with the guy and, and how his passion, his passion, so. So now with the COVID-19 pandemic and the need for ventilators, um, can you talk to us about how, this, what's the procedure now to get your ventilator in to get approved into production and then into the marketplace? Well, it's actually fascinating. Um, the procedures are probably not optimal, I'll be honest with you. There's an awful lot of people now, I'm going to say the word, you know, jumping on the bandwagon. And what they're trying to do is produce uh, ventilators, which really aren't ventilators. They're airbag compression devices, similar to that what I was referring to before, but mechanic mechanized, right? But ours is far more than that. Over the last three years, we've developed a true ventilator with, which has a control package to it, which means I can control, I shouldn't say I, we can control the air pressure, the, the, the breaths per minute. There's a, an alarm if the power goes out. So there's a number of functionalities that ours has over others. But because we weren't politically connected, I'm going to be honest, uh, at the time, and, uh, and you had Magnus of the World and all these other big organizations, auto, part, auto parts manufacturers who have capacity, God bless them, they jumped on to create these ventilators uh, and the government was paying them to do so. We haven't had any government assistance at this point in time. The last three and a half years has been actually quite painful to raise money because no one cared. So I was funding a lot, all, excuse me, an awful lot of it. Uh, just to keep it going and developing it slowly but we developed the right product not not a rushed product so at this point in time we've applied for the ontario program to help us ontario together 
we'll see where that goes. We're just about to enter uh, our product into the Health Canada certification, and we're probably going to be going to the States for FDA. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, but really, our product was initially developed for the developing nations, in particular Africa, uh, not necessarily North America. Having said that, we found now with the, the COVID-19 crisis that our product is, has applications throughout the world, including Canada and the United States. So we're at a stage now where because our product does not need an intubation. Are you familiar with that term? Yes, I am. So. Yeah. Ours uses a BiPAP mask, it's, it's a, a tight fitting mask that does not require, although we can adapt it for intubation if necessary, but we don't need to, uh, that people do not need to be specially trained. So, you know, most general practitioners, nurses, they're not trained to intubate a, a person because it can be very dangerous. Most eMERGE doctors are. So with a normal ventilator requiring intubation, you need to have a specially trained person you need an anesthesiologist, and more importantly, you need an ICU bed, and those are in dire needs. Ours none, does not require any of that because ours is a portable device about the size of a banker's box that anyone can use. In fact, anywhere where you find a defrib machine right now in community centers, et cetera, our, ours could be put there, and it's only at a $1,000 U.S. cost. That's our target price, extremely low a cost. So we're planning now for nursing homes. Let me put it to you this way. On a scale of one to 10 of respiratory distress, where one is very low and 10 is, is severe, our product would help a person up to a level six or seven, where a, a, a more expensive, sophisticated ventilator would be required from a seven and up. So imagine all the people in nursing homes as one example right now, because it's, it's in the news that don't have to be moved to a hospital, can stay in their own bed and have their regular the, uh, people around them helping them with this very basic uh, uh, ventilator. So we're very excited by the applications. They could even be put on airplanes. It's, it's going to be revolutionary. Wonderful. And, you know, I, I realize now that I, I said that I understand what intubation means, but maybe you should explain that to somebody who may be watching that doesn't understand the difference between having the mask and having intubation done. So for most people who are on a ventilator, they have to have a tube put down their throat. And, and that can be a very dangerous procedure. That's called intubation. So that's what we avoid. We don't need to. Although, again, in some African nations where our product would probably be the main ventilator, there is going to be an intubation uh, uh, application that we can apply. Right. And that would be for, for people that require e even more care. As you're saying other end from like seven to ten of the the ventilation chart Correct. Correct. yeah wonderful so other um, now i know um i'm sure that everybody is anxious to get this product out one have you been approached by other countries now that all this information has come out about your ventilator oh yes now suddenly we've been approached uh by numerous people we mm -hmm. have uh people calling us from india we have manufacturers in india looking to manufacture to supply the asian markets we have uh, distribu distribution from Africa, throughout Africa, Asia. I've just been contacted by someone from the United States of America. We have European people contacting us, but we're not quite there yet. We're probably about five to seven weeks away from final testing and durability testing. And when that happens, we can start manufacturing and getting this product out. Uh, like I said before, I'd rather do things right, not rushed, and produce a, a a great product, not just a, you know, not great product. I'm being polite here. Well, there's a lot to be said for that because when you are rushed, everyone is excited. You know, everyone wants to get it out there and mistakes can happen and proper testing procedures aren't necessarily um, done in the same format when you do take your time. So it is very important, I think, that uh, for the quality and for the care, these are human lives that we're talking about. So 100%. quality and the care uh, that you're taking is is wonderful and i'm sure very much appreciated from those people that um you know hopefully um well will be using the product but um surviving it and making it to the other side because of the product that you're creating yep. well we actually have a great uh, meeting on friday with a, a canadian manufacturer and again they are focused on saving lives 
as much as anything. And that's our first and foremost dream, save lives. I've made my money. My family's comfortable. I want to leave a legacy now. And that legacy is at some point in the future, I can look back and say, you know, my three partners and myself, we were part of saving a lot of lives. And that's what I want to be able to say. So money is, is, is not the driver here. It's, it's what we can do for the world at this point in time. Well, um, thank you for all that you are doing uh, for everyone. And, and we do definitely appreciate it because to look back, that's quite the legacy to look back and think of the amount of lives um, that you helped save um, and will continue to save as these, as a, this ventilator is used in all the different scenarios that you, that you mentioned earlier, what, be it on an airplane or in rec centers with the DFib um, devices, whatever it's there to, to save lives. And uh, that's a legacy that, uh, um, is phenomenal so thank you so much for doing that thank for you. us we've got we've got a few minutes left and i wanted sure. to talk about this is not exactly um the creation of this ventilator isn't your background that's not what you do so let's talk about a little bit what you've been doing and what your company's doing to help other businesses during this COVID 19 pandemic uh, sure so i'm a cpa and an mba so i've used my degrees to build i have a, a cpa firm that's a tax and accounting and audit firm and thankfully, I've got some spectacular staff that they do the bulk of the work, which frees me up to do these type of philanthropic things. Uh, I've been a businessman first and foremost. I've bought companies, sold companies. I've helped an awful lot of clients that whose companies were in distress. I helped them turn them around, raise money, all sorts of stuff. So right now, what our firm is geared to is helping a lot of the small business uh, deal with this, this shutdown, which is a, a terrible situation to be in for a lot of small business. So we're helping them with uh, negotiations with landlords. Negoti and I'm a landlord, so I understand both sides of the equation. You know, uh, negotiating with other suppliers, cash flow management, teaching my clients and my business friends how to be really tough business people now because it's easy to run a business when the sun is shining. It's a lot harder when that proverbial fecal matter hits that rotating device, if, if I can say that. You know, at the end of the day, there's an awful lot going on. So we're helping them with the applications with the government right now, like for instance, on Monday, that 75% uh, wage subsidy is finally kicking in. So we're, we're lining up a lot of clients to help them with that application. But more importantly, it's now it's a time for my clients and my friends to learn how to run a business. Cash flow management is king. It's not just a financial statement that what happened last year. It's future looking. You know, this is part of what I lecture at the MBA schools as well. You know, it's how to be a business person, you know, from T to green, not just a salesman, not just an operations guy, not just a manufacturer, but a true total businessman that understands the total cycle of running a business. And at the end of the day, the whole point of a business is to is to secure and, and to feed your family. So the ultimate objective is to create family wealth, not just business wealth. So that's kind of where I've been. I've been more of an advisor role now. Past are the days where I would do the tax returns myself and financial statements and things of that nature. I'm more now the ideas guy and the strategist. So. Well, and I think that's phenomenal because look at where you're bringing us now um, with your philanthropic activities and and what you're doing and we're thankful for the fact that you have that free time to be able to to take on projects like you do because it is a very hard time for business owners i'm a small business owner um you know i part of my business is going well at this point but the other part of my business has completely stopped so having somebody to to provide information and to to kind of guide people in this really trying time well lewis i want to thank you so much for sharing this information and i wish you the best of luck uh, with the ventilator and everything that's happening with that. And thank you for taking the time to speak with us today. These are uncertain times. And in these moments, we're reminded of the importance and generosity of volunteers. At Rogers TV, we are truly grateful for our volunteer crew members. Their involvement strengthens and inspires us. During National Volunteer Week, we at Rogers TV applaud you, community TV volunteers. And we look forward to seeing you again soon. Blood in the urine. 
is the most common symptom of bladder cancer. Don't ignore this warning sign. Not even once. Welcome to this COVID-19 update for Rogers. My name is Tina Avery, and I wanted to start with an update from Wellington Dufferin Guelph Public Health with regards to symptoms. So I'm gonna read that out for you right now. Um, as per the ministry guidance to ramping up testing, the criteria for those who may be tested for COVID-19 has been updated. Please go to an assessment center if you have one of the following symptoms, fever and or a new onset cough or difficulty breathing. Please go to an assessment center if you have two of the following symptoms, chills, fatigue, headache, sore throat, runny nose, stuffy or congested nose, loss or sense of smell or taste, uh, hoarse voice, difficulty swallowing, digestive issues such as nausea, uh, vomiting, diarrhea, or stomach pain, or for the younger children, if they're having any sluggishness or lack of appetite. So two of those symptoms means that you would go um, to the assessment center. Um, start off with the online assessment tool. It has also been updated to reflect these range of symptoms. Visit ontario.ca slash coronavirus to take the self-assessment tool. Locations and hours for the assessment uh, center in Orangeville are at 140 Rolling Hills Drive on Highway 10 in Orangeville from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Um, and visit wdgcpublichealth.ca for the assessment center information. So I hope you got all of that important information. Um, I hope you are all doing well and you are safe. I'm thrilled to introduce our next two guests that are joining us, two lovely ladies that are joining us from separate rooms um, in one home, Anne-Marie Reynolds and her sister, Christine Dougal. Thank you so much for joining me today, Anne-Marie. Oh, you're very welcome, Tina. Thanks for having us. Wonderful. So let's talk about making the making and the procedures of non-medical masks. I understand that you two have undertaken the, the project to make masks. So what made you both decide to do that? Well, it was actually uh, a friend of mine that contacted me about three and a half, four weeks ago, uh, Lori Siapara from uh, Comfort Keepers. She was looking for masks for her PSWs and stuff. And she knew that my sister sewed. So she messaged me to see if she would make some masks. And uh, once we did that, I said to Christine, you know, it might not, there might be more people out there that would like to wear masks or need masks. Or what about the hospital? Especially when we started getting um, uh, news about all the hospitals not getting any equipment and stuff like that. So uh, we thought we would try it and we put it out on Facebook and you know, social media, it just goes, Boom, <laughs> like just went crazy. And how many masks did you get so far? Um, yesterday we hit our thousandth mask. <laughs> wow, that is phenomenal. Good for you ladies, that's very impressive. Um, so are they available for purchase for people who are looking to yeah. get a mask? Yep, there's different types of masks that we make. So my sister can maybe go over that with you a little bit, but uh, just to buy a, a mask is $2. Um, if you are a healthcare, uh, if you're in the healthcare industry, a PSW, work in seniors homes, um, a frontline worker, then we donate them to you. Um, so if, yeah, if anybody out there would like to contact us at 4-1, then go for it. We would love to help you out. And uh, are you limiting people to the number of masks? No, nope, whatever they need. No, nope. we might have to say, okay, that might take a couple days, just depending. Like we just got an order from Perry Sound. Uh, seniors home for 100 masks for tomorrow like they asked us today so yeah we're on that one right now <laughs> wow that's 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 impressive that you're you're getting them all the way out there as well and and yep. good for you for everybody because there is such a need and um i've had several uh different experts come on and we, we talked about the use of masks and how it's important in that it doesn't just protect you it protects those around you so if you are somebody who may be walking around you may be asymptomatic you may not have any symptoms at all but by you wearing a mask you're protecting those people that you may come close to although we're all still practicing the physical distancing but there are occasions where people end up being a little bit closer so by wearing a mask out um, when you're doing your groceries going to pick up any prescriptions doing any of those important essential trips out there um, I do encourage you to wear a mask as I've started to do it it's, it's a different phenomenon but you know what we yep. do we, we keep people safe that's right that's right and i think sometimes when i'm wearing my mask it, it kind of reminds me about that social distancing to oh stay back or if i see somebody else have one so, uh, because it, this obviously takes getting used to like staying away from people yeah it really does yeah 
this has been quite an adjustment for all of us. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. Right. So having those reminders, wearing gloves and wearing a mask, if, if you can get them, um, by all means, I, please do. Um, so let's talk about the making of the mask. Is there a certain or a best type of material that people should use if they're looking to make a mask? Um, uh, you want to use 100% cotton, for sure. Um, we do three layers of cotton. Uh, we also make mat ones with like a poly, uh, my sister knows the name of it, uh, like a filter that goes in between as well. You can get those ones mm -hmm. or you can get one with a slit that you can put your own mask or own filter in as well. But uh, and, oh, with the children's one, we only do two layers of cotton just for the children because yeah, it, if they can't really breathe, they won't wear it. So we try to make it as not as annoying as possible for them. <laughs> so if somebody picks up a mask um, and they want to use their own filter, what types of filters um, do you use? Because I wouldn't even know where to begin. Yep, uh, Fabricland actually, they had um, uh, a whole stack in, they're gone now obviously, of this poly pro Christine will tell you the name, I'm so sorry. Um, they're the ones that gave it to us. Um, now again, we don't advertise as medical masks at all, like we want people to know that. This is just for that extra precaution and um, you know, if, if the nurses or whatever have their own uh, mask or filter that they want to put in, we've left space for them to do that. So they can use their own filters. Wonderful. So, I mean, we've already discussed, obviously you're making different sizes because you have a children's size and adult size, that yeah. sort of thing. Um, when you, are they machine washable? Is it some, or is it something yeah. that you use once? Yep, um, the ones without the filter sewn in, uh, so just the three pl uh, the three layers of cotton, they are machine and machine washable and dryer. They're fine. Um, you might want to iron them afterwards because they're cotton. So um, if you if yeah if you don't like wrinkles like me, uh, but the other ones you can't. You can only put them in the washing machine. The ones with the filter already sewn in, you can't use the dryer. Okay, mm -hmm. good good to know. So why don't you take the process of how a mask is made? Sure. Okay. So we've actually had a lot of help, and I just want to uh, say thank you to all the people that have donated a lot of the material. Like we've had sheets and bolts of material and, and threads and elastics. And you wouldn't believe that the amount the community has been uh, made together. For this. So it's been awesome. So um, we have a couple of helpers. So here is my nephew. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Luke. There you go. Say, Luke, say hi, Luke. Hi. Okay, so Luke does the cutting of all the elastic, and the elastic is seven inches long. Um, and then he brings it up to my sister. And then there's me. So, Luke, if you can give me some space, please. Okay. All right. So then I come to the cutting board, and here is the material, well, one of the materials that we have. And on the cutting board, I would just cut it. So I will switch me around again. There we go. So there's the material, there's the cutting board. I would cut them into nine by seven pieces. Just measure them out. Okay, so I have a bunch cut already upstairs, um, and I give them to Christine, and she takes over from there. So I'm going to uh, go up to Christine, or you guys can switch over to Christine, and she can help you out. Have a serger, it just makes things a little bit easier. So if you don't have a serger, it doesn't mean you can't make these, all right? You can still make them, and they're quite simple. So you take your, it's seven uh, by nine inches, all right? And I would have my outer layer, and then I would put together the inner layer and sew those together. So I would just serve them together at the, just at the top for now. Then I would take my third layer and I take my elastic, okay, and I pin it about a quarter of an inch away from the edge. And you would pin that there. Then you go right around doing the same thing both sides. Now you would sew these together. To arrive at this. So now it's sewn together. Okay. So you want to take your other, your double piece. Okay. You're going to sew it 
together. Now, you want to make sure that you keep a little opening here, the little opening from here to here so that you can turn it inside out. So, we'll sew. Again, it can be done on a regular machine. So I have my little hole at the top there. So when it's all sewn together, I can turn it inside out. Now, for the nose piece, we are using twist ties that you would use in the gar for the garbage bags. They're kind of hard to come by nowadays because they don't really come with the garbage bags. You can use a pipe cleaner or um, some of the uh, cords, the metal cords, you can strip them and they'll have a little piece of uh, wiring, like about nine pieces of wiring in them. You can use that for the nose piece that you want, okay? Now I just gauged the middle of it and I put, and I sew this right in. For those of you who wanna measure it and make sure that's right in the center, you can go right ahead. But I've been doing this for quite a while so I can pretty much gauge it to the center. And I would sew it right in. Like that. Okay, so I do have one that I put together and it's sewn all the way around and make sure I still have that little hole. Okay, so once I'm finished this part, I would then pass it over onto the counter. My sister takes it away and she'll show you what she does to it. Okay, so. <laughs> Hi, Tina. <laughs> So quickly, I uh, turn these inside out. I forgot to strip. That's okay. All right. All right. Like <laughs> this. Um, and then we gather them. We put gathers in them and put pins in them at both sides. So I have one that is already done, like that. Um, and then I just sew around the machine, the, the edges, okay, which I will show you when it's already done. There we go. All right, and there's your, there's your mask. Amazing. <laughs> that's wonderful. I mean, it, it was hard for us to see, but you walk on. Yeah, that's what I, yeah, I tried to move the, the camera for you. I'm so sorry, but no, um, no. I can, Sorry, Tina, go ahead. That's okay. That's not a problem. I mean, I knew we weren't going to be able to get close up. We're, we're in some isolated kind of different ways of, of, of yeah. uh, right now. So that's not a problem whatsoever. So what type of recommendations, we've got uh, just under a minute left. So what kind of recommendations would you give to somebody who's trying to do this on their own? What's the best place to start? Um, well, they can always message Christine, first of all, for any advice. That, that'd be great. Um, but just make sure that you're using cotton. For sure, if it's got to be 100% cotton, that's what the doctors have been saying. Uh -huh. um, and make sure it's breathable. Make sure you can breathe because, like I said, if they if they can't breathe, they're not going to want to wear them, right? So um, yeah, and the, oh, the dimensions are seven by nine, seven inches by nine inches. There's a wonderful. Well, ladies, I want to thank you so much for um, joining us today to share how we you're making the masks, and I'm sure you may get a lot of people calling you very soon to, uh, <laughs> to be able to get some masks from you because I don't own a sewing machine, so the first call might be me. <laughs> but thank yeah, you so much that's for joining us, and uh, uh, stay safe and healthy. Thank you, Tina. Thanks. I thank you again, everybody in the community that has been helping out. So awesome. Thank you so much. All right, take care of yourself, guys.